So good morning. Um, I'll try not to yell on the microphone. Uh, I will talk about the early phases of uh, protoplanetary disks, uh, which actually provide the initial stages for planet formation. And you need to remember that planets form very early uh, after the formation of its parent star. So you have to consider the planet formation process in, uh, is very much a part of the star formation process. And this is how I think the stars form. First, you have a big molecular cloud, like the, the ones you hear this morning, that collapses. And because you, it has some initial rotation or there is a little bit of turbulence in there, it uh, leads to the formation of a star and a protostellar disk around it. The disk is initially is quite thick. You can barely see the star in there. And then the disk slowly dissipates, and eventually you have a planetary system forming. In terms of planet formation, we believe it can happen two ways. F the first approach is the uh, bottom-up approach. You have dust particles that coagulate and, bring, uh, and produce progressively larger and larger bodies until you, you reach a planet. It's a process that may take a bit too long, a few million years. And the second way to form planets, at least giant planets, is the so-called disk fragmentation. It's a top-bottom approach, so you start with a disk that is gravitationally unstable and fragments, breaks into pieces the planets. So if you see these two formation mechanisms in view of the star formation process, core accretion gives planets within a million years, so it's a, it's a relatively long process, whereas this fragmentation gives planets um, within a few thousand years. And for this mechanism to work, you need to have gravitationally unstable, relatively massive disks, so you have to go to the early phase for these disks. Thankfully, we are in the age of ALMA, and this uh, very good instrument produces uh, very nice images of disks, and this is one that was released maybe a couple of years now, ago, and it was very surprising. This is the so-called HL Tau. It's a very young system, and the people discovered these gaps in this disk and also these bright rings. It's very surprising to see this probably signs of planet formation on such a uh, very young system. So people think maybe planets form in these gaps or maybe in these bright rings. So it, and also there are many theories that these, are not, these gaps are not associated with planets. But this observation and other observations um, opens up the exciting possibility that planets may form much faster than we previously thought. So when a planet forms in these disks, we have to take a look at the big, bigger picture. This is not just an isolated disk. It's in the middle of a cloud. There is an envelope around it. There is outflows in these directions. So the initial stages of planet formation in these disks may be more dynamical than we previously thought. And this is another disk that shows this uh, spiral arms, this is a class two uh, disk. And finally, a disk that shows sign of gravita uh, gravitational fragmentation, of breaking up. So here you have a binary, uh, about one solar mass. You have a disk which is very large, about 400 AU in radius and relatively massive. And this is a simulation I've done a few years ago. Uh, it uh, follows the collapse of a molecular cloud. Um, here, I just show you, you only the center of the cloud. You can see a star forms, and then the disk assembles around, in, uh, around the star, grows in mass, and eventually fragments. But you can see the disk is not symmetric. You have these plumes of material that feed in the disk with mass. So these early phase disks, they seem to exist. ALMA gives us observation of these disks, and they seem to be relatively massive and relatively uh, large. So what I will discuss now is what will happen if a planet forms at a very early stage in these disks. 
There are two problems that I will talk about. First of all, whether uh, a planet that forms in this disk can avoid fast migration. There are planet-disk interactions that make the planet move inwards closer to the star. And secondly, whether this protoplanet uh, can avoid fast mass growth. Imagine this planet forms in a very uh, gas-rich environment, so it can accrete a lot of material from the disk, and it may well increase its mass to become a brown dwarf, rather, or even a low mass star. So when you put a planet in a, in a disk, you can have two types of interactions. If your planet mass is relatively small, the planet cannot open a gap in the disk and migrates relatively fast inwards. And if the planet is more massive, it can open up a gap, and then its migration is slowed down considerably. So what happens if you put a planet in this type of disks? Early studies have shown that the planet migrates inwards very fast, within a few thousand years. And the migration, it, it, because it migrates so fast, it's not able to open up a gap. So there is no way to stop this migration. So this is the study by uh, Barrett et al. They used the very, uh, relatively massive disk, 0.4 solar masses, um, using a 2D goat. But something that they miss is that the planets have fixed mass. They're not allowed to accrete mass from, from, from the disk. And again, another similar study from uh, Michael et al. that appeared uh, the same year, found similar thing, fast migration. So what, I, what is plotted here in the distance from the star versus time. So started at about 25 AU, astronomical units going to 16 AU. But again, these authors here did not include uh, did not consider the increase of the mass of the protoplanet. So I tried to uh, study a similar system. I have a mass, a stellar mass of one solar mass and a disk of 0.1 solar masses, and I embed a protoplanet of one Jupiter mass at a distance of 50 AU. And in my models, I include the mass increase of the planet due to accretion of material from the disk, and also, in one of the models, I also include radiative feedback from the planet to the disk. Because matter is accreted onto the planet, energy, gravitational energy is transformed into thermal energy on the accretion shock around the protoplanet. And this energy is radiated back into the disk and hits the protoplanetary disk. So here you can see the planet creates these wakes in the disk as it moves around. It accretes quite a bit of mass, as I will show you later. And eventually, it open, opens up a gap. So this um, circle here just shows you the initial orbit of the planet. So when the planet opens up the gap, its migration is slowed down, because now matter cannot flow from, from this gap uh, freely. And the opening up of the gap is a direct consequence of the fact that the protoplanet is increasing in mass. So it has the power to open up the gap to accrete more material and make this uh, um, gas-free region in there. So when I check out what happens with the uh, migration, uh, with the semi-major axis of the planet, initially, so this is distance from the star versus time. Initially, the migration is fast, like the previous uh, authors have found, uh, with a similar time scale of 10,000 years. But then, once the gap is opened up, the migration stops, and even turns out uh, changes to a, an outward migration. I've done a few simulations varying the parameters of the models. Um, the ones you can focus is the blue line, which is um, without the radiative feedback from the planet, and the red line, which includes radiative feedback from the planet. So in this case, when you include some energy fed back into the disk from the planet, the migration continues for a longer period of time, but then eventually it stops, and it turns out from a type 1 migration, a fast migration, to a very, very slow migration. So the planet 
may survive in a relatively wide distance from the, um, from the stellar star. And in fact, there are observations of planets at uh, 50, 100, and even 200, and even more astronomical units that are very difficult to form with the standard formation scenario, the core accretion scenario, because it's difficult to have dust coagulation being so efficient at such large distances from the central star. But uh, there is a problem here. If you check what happens to the mass of the planet, it's plotted here in uh, Jupiter masses, you start with a one Jupiter mass planet, but very quickly it reaches the deuterium burning limit and becomes eventually, this protoplanet becomes a brown dwarf. Its mass is about 25 to 30 Jupiter masses. Only in the case that the radiative feedback from the planet is included, you get something that is in the limit between a, a brown dwarf and a planet. In fact, the, many of the observations of wide orbit planets saw that they're relatively massive. And another interesting thing is what happens is in this very massive disk is you have interactions of the protoplanet with a relatively with a gravitationally unstable disk. So there is a lot of structure in the disk. And through this interaction, you can excite the eccentricity of the planets. You can make some of the eccentric systems that are being observed. So this is eccentricity versus time. This is you get something like 0.1 in some cases, 0.15. But in the case when the feedback for the planet is included, this stabilizes the disk, the interactions between the planet and the disk are uh, more regular in a way. So the red line, if you're not here, you get an almost circular planet. I think I'll skip that. Another interesting thing is that if, if you, that you find is that if, uh, um, if uh, you consider what happens to the region around the protoplanet, the protoplanet accretes material and feeds this energy back to the disk. And at the initial stages of, uh, of its formation, it can accrete quite a bit of material. So its luminosity can be, uh, and it's a very small object too, so its luminosity can be quite uh, high. So this, if you note this red line here. So if you are very lucky to observe a system that has a planet forming there, uh, and, it, and it's very young while, while it is forming, then maybe you are able to observe it uh, despite being a very uh, a low mass object. And there are some types of observations. So this is the LK calcium 15 system. What you have here is a protostellar disk and the star is the white one and these two dots are candidate protoplanets. And in one of them, it has been detected H alpha emission, which is a characteristic of uh, accretion of material of an object. So this object may well be a, a young accreting protoplanet. So to conclude, I'd just like to, basically I think the main thing to take away is that the early phase disks are not the nice symmetric disks that uh, all the uh, previous planet uh, formation models and uh, the models about the, what processes happen in the early phases of the solar system have considered. They're very dynamical. You may have uh, lots of asymmetries. Uh, mass flows from the envelope to the disk. So you have to consider how this affects our view of uh, the evolution of the solar system. And there is growing evidence from, from ALMA that these young disks, indeed, they are very massive and they have a lot of, a lot of structure. It's not just a, a theorist's uh, 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 imagination. And and the main specific result of this work is that giant planets uh, that form early on may be able to uh, open up gaps in their disks. Uh, and although they migrate inwards, the migration is not as fast as previously believed. So these protoplanets may actually survive at relatively uh, wide distances from their parent stars. Thank you. <laughs>